Hello all, and welcome to this episode of Thermonuclear Takes from Physical Attraction. As a reminder, this is the type of bonus episode where we deal with some news stories that have been on my mind, which are usually mm, at least tangentially related to stuff that's been covered on the show. As such, it's looser, it's freer, I spend less time on the script, I'm a bit briefer on each story, it's more topical and less timeless, but hopefully it will provoke some interest and a little bit of discussion. If you don't want to hear about stories in the news, and right now who could blame you, I would say just await a more regular episode. But I've been wanting to do an episode a bit like this for a while now, just summarising some of the various financial madness that has been going on lately. A little later on in this mini-series that we've got, I want to try and answer the question, why is it that in the middle of the greatest global economic depression in a century, the stock market seems to remain very high and buoyant even as much of the economy has been shut down and unemployment has skyrocketed? But before we get that, I want to lead off with some aperitifs. First off, I want to thank listener Jason, who wrote in with some corrections to something I said in the episode on China going for net zero. I said, as part of my rant about how China owns a lot of renewable infrastructure, that a Chinese company, Cattle, made the batteries for Tesla. Jason pointed out that Tesla gets its batteries from a variety of different sources, including Panasonic, LG Chem in South Korea, and their own manufacturer. Tesla have also announced that their next generation battery won't have any cobalt in it, so if they achieve that, that will be another rare earth metal that they won't need to supply. I think this is all fair enough, and it's certainly true to say that in the course of the rant, I did oversimplify what is a very complicated supply and integration chain for batteries. It's not fair to say that Chinese companies would be the only ones to make money from Tesla selling cars, obviously. However, I do think that most observers would agree with the overall point that Chinese companies and governmental interests do disproportionately dominate a lot of the supply chain for renewables and batteries, as they do for a lot of industries, by the way, in part due to long-term strategic investment in this area. I think in my rush to point that out, I clearly have oversimplified and left out a lot of important information about specifically how Tesla gets its batteries. So thanks to Jason there for keeping me honest, and listeners, if you spot me making mistakes, do let me know and I will endeavour to correct them. Now the next brief thing I want to talk about is the FinCEN files. I don't want to do any detailed analysis, but simply to note that our standards for action on this kind of thing are, are pretty low, aren't they? If you don't know what the FinCEN files are, and I've spoken to people who literally work in banks who don't know, it's another major leak of information that implicates a lot of mainstream banks in activity that may well be criminal and is, at best, negligent. So what this is, is when the banks spot suspicious activities taking place, uh, they have to submit these suspicious activity reports, or SAR notifications, and these now have been leaked to the public. And they found that this sort of thing is going on on a truly massive scale. Approximately $2 trillion of transactions have been flagged as suspicious that are just the tip of the iceberg here. This is just a fraction of the overall number that has been flagged, as this leaked data is just a fraction of the overall load of information. This story made it to the front pages for perhaps a few hours before being displaced by the rush of news that is 2020. Here are some highlights from the leak, uh, according to some of the data that's been analysed according to the BBC. Quote, HSBC allowed fraudsters to move millions of dollars of stolen money around the world, even after it learned from US investigators that the scheme was a scam. JP Morgan allowed a company to move more than $1 billion through a London account without knowing who owned it. The bank later discovered that the company might be owned by a mobster on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. There was evidence that one of Russian President Vladimir Putin's closest associates was using Barclays Bank in London to avoid sanctions, which were meant to stop him using financial services in the West. Some of the cash that he pumped through there was used to buy works of art, which is another thing that criminals often like to do. The husband of a woman who has donated $1.7 million to the UK's governing Conservative Party was secretly funded by a Russian oligarch with close ties to President Putin. The UK, specifically, is called a higher-risk jurisdiction and compared to Cyprus by the Intelligence Division of FinCEN. That's because the number of UK-registered companies that appear in the suspicious activity reports there's over 3,000 UK companies that are named in the FinCEN files, which is more than any other country. There's also more evidence about various different banks. The UAE's central bank failed to act on warnings about a local firm which was helping Iran evade sanctions. Deutsche Bank has moved money launderers' dirty money around for organised crime, terrorists and drug traffickers. And Standard Chartered Bank moved cash for Arab Bank for more than a decade, after clients' accounts at that bank had been used to fund terrorism. So that's just a sort of snapshot of some of the stories that have come out as a result of the leak of this information. 
And obviously this is not the first time that this kind of information has been leaked, which is really sort of just illustrating the the vast levels of these transactions um, that in many cases are illicit or suspicious that are going on all the time in the uh, financial engineering uh, schemes that we have around us in the world. So if you think of the Paradise Papers in 2017, the Panama Papers in 2016, Swiss leaks in 2015, Lux leaks of 2014, all of these things illustrated similarly vast networks of money flowing around, some of it legally, some of it illicitly, and there were exposed similar financial wrongdoings and crimes, mostly things like the use of offshore accounts and dealings by corporations and wealthy individuals to avoid paying as much tax as they possibly can. In this case, what we see is that the banks are flagging up trillions in suspicious transactions, much of it related to suspected money laundering. But once they have flagged the transaction as suspicious, that's all they have to do to avoid prosecution. In many cases, they will continue serving and making money from clients who have had many suspicious transactions flagged. And the regulators who try and stop this stuff from going on are just swamped, and therefore they barely prosecute any of this stuff. So, for example, here in the UK, we have a really big problem with this. The National Crime Agency, NCA, estimates that many hundreds of billions of pounds are laundered through UK banks and their subsidiaries every single year. The NCA's 2017 risk assessment for the UK found that high-end and cash-based money laundering remained the greatest areas of money laundering risk to the UK, with retail and wholesale banking and private wealth management providing a crucial gateway for criminals to launder their funds. The UK's wealth management industry manages 800 billion of global wealth in dollars at a particular risk of laundering. Yet, the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, which has primary responsibility for prosecuting money laundering, has only opened 24 investigations into companies for breaches of the UK's money laundering regulations since 2007, and has brought zero prosecutions. So all of the crime agencies, all of the independent investigators, everyone is saying that there's huge amounts of money laundering going on in the UK, in the city of London. And in the last decade or more, we've had 24 investigations and zero prosecutions. Transparency International UK's research has already identified 86 UK banks and financial institutions which have, unwittingly or otherwise, helped corrupt individuals acquire assets and move suspicious wealth. This investigation shows how UK shell companies remain a vehicle of choice for money launderers around the world. Broadly, their research has found at least 929 UK shell companies, used in 89 corruption and money laundering cases, amounting to around £137 billion globally in potential economic damage. And this could just be the tip of the iceberg. So of these two trillion in transactions that were flagged in the FinCEN papers then, that may be potentially dodgy, one wonders how many of the people involved will ever be prosecuted. Billions of dollars in dirty money, stolen money, money obtained by drug cartels, through crime, through corruption, siphoned by various people from corrupt governments, squirrelled away from the taxman. It's floating around the world all the time. The negative impact on the rest of us far outstrips many of the petty crimes that we actually prosecute. Yet it's all just accepted as a fait accompli. In the UK in particular, the company's law is very loose. On Companies House, there are dozens of shell companies that are run by clearly fictitious people, companies that are registered to, like, Adolf Hitler or Mr. MMMMMXXXXX, that are clearly being used for some sort of dodgy dealings. I mean, this has been known about for years. Oliver Bullough did some good reporting on this in The Guardian, and yet nothing is done to tighten up the regulations. It barely seems to register in the political discussions that we have. The BBC Panorama investigation that went along with this FinCEN files thing, it showed clear evidence of money laundering. But when asked for a statement, the government simply said that we have some of the best controls in the world, which the US authorities, uh, the FinCEN authorities and these leaked files clearly strongly disagree with, as they're effectively classing the UK as a sort of tax haven. So again, I don't want to go into too much detail on this story, because this is not really the sort of thing we cover here. But I just want to sort of comment that I think... It's very depressing how rooting out this kind of corruption and white-collar crime never seems to be a priority. Back in 2016, for example, we had the Panama Papers, offshore tax evasion revealed on a very monumental scale. As many as 214,000 companies set up just to help people avoid tax. 
$2 trillion passing through this one Panama-based firm where a lot of this financial activity was occurring. And yes, some changes were made. The company that handled all this money was forced to shut down, although the people involved were released on bail, and they're currently suing Netflix for defamation when they made the movie of this, so I assume they're not suffering too badly if they can afford to do that. Governments did recover around a billion dollars in taxes that were owed due to the Panama Papers, according to the uh, consortium of journalists who worked on the story. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Who knows how much of that $2 trillion should rightfully have been paid in taxes? Tax evasion costs poor nations and African nations billions of dollars a year, but they were hardly able to reclaim any of it. Indeed, in many cases, even though the elaborate mechanisms that are used allow corporations and wealthy people to avoid taxes that most of us have to pay, the flawed tax code and the lack of international enforcement means that what's done is legal. Now, there were some changes. One report found that after the Panama Papers, 16 countries or organisations did implement new laws or policies, although that's only 18% of the countries that were affected. But four years later now, for example, the first thing you look up when you see this, we have a UN report, the FACTI panel, uh, which was released in September 2020, investigating this kind of thing. And it said, quote, Even before COVID-19 disrupted lives and economies, countries faced widespread cross-border corruption, tax evasion, and other harmful practices. Sophisticated money laundering has complicated the efforts to recover the proceeds. These abuses threaten governments' abilities to provide basic goods and services and drain resources from sustainable development. We firmly believe that the current crisis has made this issue even more urgent. The pandemic has made it harder to reach the sustainable development goals. It is more important than ever to step up our collective efforts against financial crime and tax abuses. The world can still shift towards a more sustainable and resilient path. The FACT-D panel has identified gaps, impediments and vulnerabilities in the international system that allow abuses and related outflows. We take note of many of the international instruments and initiatives that address financial accountability, transparency and integrity, but we also know that implementation has fallen short. In some cases, it's become a matter of ticking boxes, while in others, even the ticks are missing. We can do better, yet even perfect implementation would not solve all problems. Those intent on abusing tax and financial systems and avoiding rules and regulations would still have ample opportunity and great reward for their efforts. Inadequate global governance is holding back progress towards the common goal of sustainable development. So that's what the UN said just at the end of September this year. In other words, despite massive leaks and exposure of what's been going on in things like the Panama Papers, a lot of this criminality is still occurring. Given the immense harm that it does, given these huge numbers and this massive economic damage that is being done by this, why don't we talk about it more often? Why aren't these facts more widely known? And why is it not more of a political issue? Why do we instead allow it to be hidden in layers of dull accountancy, and for a big leak like this to drop off the face of the news after just a few hours? Law and order focuses on prosecuting people for crimes that are, by comparison, small, compared to these much larger larcenies and thefts that are really taking place on a regular basis in the international financial system. Part of the reason I think these stories don't seem to last anymore in the news is that we've all grown resigned, apparently, to the fact that there is nothing that can be done about them. Few people get arrested or prosecuted, no one goes to trial, and no politicians even seem to get elected who make this stuff a major campaign issue. When was the last time you heard about some successful effort that had been made to combat this kind of corruption and tax evasion? And we all just accept it, even though it's much more damaging to society, in monetary terms at least, than the types of crimes that do seem to get all of the focus. And frankly, seeing the story and seeing how it just, seeing more than anything else, just how it dropped out of the news, uh, such that people I know who, as I say, work in banks, hadn't even heard about this story, I think it's something that should get more attention. So even though it's not the sort of thing that we normally cover, I'm, I'm flagging it up for people to, to think about and to look into, and that's all. So another area that has been fun to watch that's been in the news lately is further evidence of some pretty irrational exuberance in the tech sector. Now, those of you who have been listening to our episodes on SoftBank's Vision Fund will know that there's this sort of underlying thesis that a lot of companies are kind of posing as tech companies, and we've got a bit of a bubble developing in the tech sector at the moment, although none dare call it a bubble. On the subject of Jason, our listener's email, people have said that Tesla's share price is inflated at the moment. I'm inclined to agree, but 
This is as nothing compared to its wannabe rival, which hilariously called itself Nikola, as in Nikola Tesla. Get it? So I want to tell you the story of Nikola because, partly because there's some pretty hilarious details here, but also because I think this is the kind of thing that when you see it happening, alarm bell should ring in your mind thinking, <laughs> if if we're living in a, in, a, in a world, in a society, in an economy where companies can get away with this kind of behaviour and apparently be worth billions of dollars doing it, then clearly something is wrong and the system is not functioning as it should. And potentially, you know, this could lead to some very nasty consequences for more than just the people who invested in Nikola further on down the line. So Nikola then. Nikola was aiming to be a new kind of car company. The first line of its Wikipedia page might already be enough to set off a few alarm bells. Quote, Nikola Corporation is an American company that has announced a number of concept zero emissions vehicles since 2016 and has indicated plans to produce some of them in the future. So yeah, the first thing to note is that it's announced some concepts and it has plans to produce some of them in the future. Sounds like quite an early stage for a business venture, doesn't it? The first thing to note is that it spent the last four years announcing ideas for vehicles, including a hydrogen-powered truck, an electric truck, and an electric SUV. What we haven't seen is any of these vehicles actually going into production yet. Yet briefly, in June, this company was worth $20 billion in market capitalization, according to its value on the stock market. So people were buying shares that valued this company at $20 billion. This is $20 billion for some designs of cars that hadn't gone into production yet. Ford only had a market cap of $26 billion. So we have an actual established famous car company versus some designs that haven't been made yet. The type of thing that should obviously make you concerned is that maybe the market is not being entirely rational when it comes to the value of this stock. Something else that might raise eyebrows is its balance sheet. In the first six months of 2020, this $20 billion company had a revenue of just $80,000. Of those $80,000, 36000 were actually spent by its CEO, Trevor Milton, to have solar panels installed at his house. So here we have a car company that was at one point worth around the same as Ford. It has never produced a single vehicle for sale. Its only revenue in the last quarter came from literally installing solar panels for the CEO's own house, employed by him, and nothing else. That should be enough to cause some alarm bells, right? I mean, how good can their designs really be? That's what the self-admitted short sellers at Hindenburg Research thought. So they did a little digging, which is what they do. They short sell companies and then they basically dig around to see what's going on with the companies, um, particularly if they think that they're uh, exaggerating. Uh, and their stock prices inflated above what it should be. Uh, they did some digging and they released a report on the company. In the process, they described this company as an intricate fraud built on dozens of lies over the course of its founder and executive chairman Trevor Milton's career. The report also claimed that a video posted by Nikola in 2018 of a Nikola truck appearing to run under its own power was staged. The truck was actually rolling down a long and gradual hill capable of accelerating vehicles to highway speeds, and that Nikola continued to promote their claims about battery technology, despite failing to acquire the company that had that technology. Nikola repeatedly described the truck as being in motion, thus making it vague whether the truck was actually moving under its own power. And further verification by the Financial Times confirmed the claim regarding the truck rolling down a slope. So yeah, Nikola, this company, is producing this prototype wonder truck, and it's releasing a video of it rolling downhill, and sort of leading people to believe that the truck is actually being driven. It can't actually move under its own power. Some other highlights from the Hindenburg report include the following. In October 2019, Nikola announced that it would revolutionise the battery industry. This was to be done by buying a new company. But the deal fell through when Nikola realised that A, the technology was vaporware, it didn't really exist, and B, that the president of this battery company had been arrested months earlier over allegations that he conned NASA by using his expense account at NASA to pay for prostitutes. Nikola, however, has never walked back the claims relating to this battery technology. Instead, Trevor Milton continued to publicly hype the technology, 
even after becoming aware that the technology didn't exist and that its CEO was going to be arrested. This revolutionary battery technology never existed. And now Nikola plans to use GM's battery technology, General Motors' battery technology, instead. Another point from the report. Inexpensive hydrogen is fundamental to the success of Nikola's business model. Trevor Milton has claimed in a presentation to hundreds of people and in multiple interviews to have succeeded at cutting the cost of hydrogen by 81% compared to his peers and to already be producing hydrogen. Now, I should point out that this would be a really huge deal. One of the things that we're doing in our series on climate change, which is in the works at the moment, is we're talking about some of the alternatives. One of the very, very important things that hydrogen can do is it can replace heating, it can replace natural gas, it's a burnable fuel, and the product is water. Um, Part of the problem with hydrogen has been that a lot of the hydrogen that's made at the moment is made from natural gas, and it releases CO2 in the process of making it. But you can also make it by electrolyzing water, in other words, by passing an electrical current through water to produce hydrogen. Now, if you had low-cost hydrogen um, that was being produced renewably, as Nikola is sort of seeming to claim here, that would be a huge deal, because you'd have a case where you could generate solar power, for example, and uh, convert that into hydrogen. Um, And then, of course, because the hydrogen can be stored as a fuel, you don't need to worry so much about this intermittency issue. Um, You have the idea of wind power, you know, where the wind can also create hydrogen. There are some UK government-backed projects that are hoping to do that sort of thing in the future. That would be so-called green hydrogen. Uh, The hydrogen that's made at the moment with natural gas is blue hydrogen, and it's important to be aware of the distinction. But lots and lots of modellers and people who are concerned about decarbonising the power sector and avoiding CO2 emissions in the future are keen for green hydrogen to play a much bigger role. So the idea that Nikola, this company, has cut the cost of hydrogen by 80% would be a huge deal if it was true. But it turns out that Nikola has not produced hydrogen at this price or at any price, as the CEO has admitted when pressed by the media. Trevor Milton, the CEO, appointed his brother Travis as director of hydrogen production slash infrastructure to oversee this incredible new hydrogen technology. But it doesn't seem like Travis has done anything with hydrogen before. It's mostly been to do with pouring concrete driveways and doing subcontractor work on home renovations in Hawaii. The company hyped up its share price with a big reveal of its Nikola One truck. But Bloomberg has debunked the claims regarding this semi-truck. I mean, Milton said that this thing fully functions and works. He said, this is a real truck. But behind-the-scenes photos have shown that Nikola had an electricity cable snaked up from underneath the stage into the truck in order to falsely claim that Nikola's electrical systems fully functioned. I mean, this sort of thing is going back to our uh, long-time listeners will remember we had an episode on free energy scams when we were talking about the laws of thermodynamics. And one of the things that you see with a lot of these free energy scams is there's actually literally just a secret plug that is plugging in uh, the uh, thing that is claiming to generate power. And that's quite literally what Nikola, this company that was briefly worth $20 billion, has done. Um, Hindenburg's report goes on. There's even more evidence here. They, they learned through emails and interviews with former partners that Trevor had had an artist stencil the words H2 and zero emission hydrogen electric on the side of the truck. It has no hydrogen capabilities whatsoever. This is false advertising. It was built just using natural gas fuel cells instead. In 2019, Nikola revealed a next-generation version of its off-road vehicle, but it was scrapped within weeks of the unveiling due to challenges in manufacturing it. Now, they have a a much-touted order book, you know, that although it's been revealed that the only actual work that the company has done in the first six months has been installing solar panels at the CEO's house, um, they're claiming that they have billions upon billions of dollars uh, in pending orders for their vehicles. But this accountancy doesn't add up at all. A company called Express reportedly accounts for a third of its reservations. So supposedly this company has ordered 3.5 billion from Nikola. But this company only has 1.3 million in cash on hand. So how on earth is it going to be able to buy 3.5 billion worth of vehicles? And of course, Nikola's key partners, this is another indication of a business that's doing some really dodgy stuff, the people who have been backing it have been cashing out aggressively. 
so Worthington, Bosch, Value Act, who all came in with this company, have sold shares. They've been selling hundreds of millions of shares. Worthington sold 237 million of shares over a two-day span in July, and another 250 million in August. And Hindenburg say that they think that they know exactly what type of company Nikola is, and they expect that as this uh, much-touted partnership with GM boosts its stock price, many of the key investors will continue to quit. And finally, of course, the CEO himself has cashed in here. So the report concludes, We think that Trevor Milton, through dozens of outright lies, was able to form partnerships with some of the largest legacy auto companies in the world in their desperation to catch up to Tesla's EV leadership status. Trevor has ensured that he's not going down with the ship. He cashed out $70 million around the time that the company first went public, and he amended his share lockup from one year to 180 days. If he's fired, his equity immediately sells, and he's entitled to collect another $20 million over two years. Milton has laid the groundwork to extract hundreds of millions from Nikola years before ever delivering on his promises. So, it's really hard to say anything other than that this company is a massive fraud operation, which is essentially just subsisting by making all of these hyped up announcements about technology that isn't really there, um, and hoping, somehow, against hope, that they can inflate this bubble for long enough to pull all of their money out of the company before the whole thing crashes. I mean, that's really what it looks like. If you're being a huge, huge optimist, I suppose you could potentially say that maybe they're hoping to raise a lot of money through hype and then actually deliver on the technology. But I think you'd have to be pretty credulous to think that that was the case. Now, initially, the CEO, Trevor Milton, decided to do what we all do these days, and whenever a catastrophe arises, he would just tweet through it. He accused the allegations of these short sellers of being biased, motivated liars, he threatened to sue them, etc. But ultimately, this didn't last long, and under investigation of fraud by the Securities and Exchange Commission, he has now resigned. His statement on his resignation, you can look it up, It reads a little bit like the kind that you might dictate from a plane to another jurisdiction where they can't extradite you back to the country of origin. So this is all extremely damning and is very bad for Nikola and anyone who bought stock in it, particularly when all of these insiders were dumping their stock. They were presumably hoping that Nikola would see the same meteoric rise in share price that Tesla has seen, to the point where Tesla itself is now massively overvalued if you ask me. The company is still, inexplicably, as I wrote this, apparently worth around $5 billion, despite the fact that pretty much all of their technology appears to be non-existent. There's a lot of hype and very little substance at all to the claims that they're making. So there are a few things that we can learn from this. One is, you know, just because someone says they're working on renewables, or just because someone says they're working on electrification and hydrogen, doesn't mean they couldn't be trying to con you. Whenever any new sector comes up, there's always a risk of this. And I think that everyone is is intimately aware now that the price of renewables has plummeted, that fossil fuel companies are really struggling to extract uh, profitable reserves at this point, and that they, they know that the energy transition is going to take place. Um, and so there's a, there's a huge deal of hype. And as um, Hindenburg Research pointed out, there's a lot of people who want this to be real. Uh, they want to believe that they are in on the ground of a company that's going to be as big as Tesla. And for the car companies that are partnering with Nikola, they want to believe they have access to this hydrogen cars and electric vehicles because they realise that that's the future now. But just because someone's making these claims doesn't mean that you should not very strongly investigate whether their technology is real or not. I mean, it, it, it's frankly insane that you have these huge demonstrations taking place with electricity cables going into the trucks to make them look functional and a car that claims to be operated by hydrogen that's actually just rolling downhill you know this this is the sort of stuff that any kind of due diligence should basically find out about and these companies should not be investing in these maniacs but they apparently have and so you know beware the hype always whenever it comes to anything like this Of course, the other thing that you learn from this is that the the COVID-19 crisis has not actually fully popped the bubble in the tech sector yet, because 
all of this massive moves in the stock price actually happened in 2020 after the COVID-19 crisis had kicked in. So instead, we're still seeing this kind of runaway bubble at the very fringe of the stock market. You might think that people would be less keen to invest their money in a risky looking venture like this brand new company that's never produced a car, but that doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. This is the kind of thing that can only happen in uh, this sort of atmosphere of irrational exuberance. Now, it might seem insane that General Motors, who announced a major partnership with Nikola and clearly did not do their due diligence on this company and how it was going to function, they're now also suffering as their shares slide. It might seem crazy that they would not find out things about this company that some random online short sellers and journalists have been able to dig up. It might seem ludicrous that a tech company could be a house of cards this obvious and yet remain undiscovered even as its stock price is inflated into the billions. But this is the kind of thing that happens a lot, especially in the heady atmosphere that the stock market is bathed in at the moment and especially the technology sector. And of course, you all know my opinion, and really the truth, it's not possible to sustain a bubble forever. Eventually, the weight of the pretense and the lies and the illusion is too much to bear. The bubble bursts, the investors run for the hills, and it all comes crumbling down into ashes. This happens every single time. There's really no reason to think that this time will be any different. So while we're laughing at a story like Nikola and how dumb and or greedy the investors who threw their money into this company must be, we need to remember a few things. Number one, of course, is that this sort of thing massively undermines the idea at the heart of neoclassical economics, that markets are always fair, that everyone always has perfect information, and that people and investors always behave rationally. If people were rational and had perfect information, They wouldn't buy stock in a company valuing it at $20 billion when all they have is a truck rolling downhill and a one-off solar panel installation business. They wouldn't pump money into something that is basically a giant fraud, the equivalent of the kind of perpetual motion machine that we talked about in the thermodynamics episodes. But clearly, they are doing. So maybe the idea that the stock market is always this immensely innovative place that allocates resources to the most competitive and the most successful companies is actually quite often untrue. And the idea that all of these shares that everyone is holding are genuinely worth what they say on the tin needs to be investigated a little bit more. And for me, I just see this sort of thing as a, as a terrible missed opportunity because there's obviously a lot of money here that wants to invest in the future, in electric vehicles, in hydrogen cars, all this sort of thing. And there's also going to be plenty of people who want to produce these technologies, you know, engineers who could be employed to do this. Um, people who have the skills and the ability to design this stuff. There's so much good that this money could do, and instead it's just being wasted on blowing up these bubbles for companies that are poorly run, badly managed by fraudsters who are better at hyping up their technology. And again, it's this classic story of, of greed and desire for rapid, quick returns and quick results over the substance of what's actually been achieved. And I find it very sad because we all know, you know, that we're going to need a lot of uh, investment and effort to stave off the climate crisis and to get off fossil fuels and onto renewables. And this kind of thing does not help at all. So shame on everyone who didn't do their job in investigating this company properly and relied on some online short sellers to investigate it and pop the bubble here. The second thing that I want to point out is that actually... Nikola is an example of a growing trend in tech companies and tech startups when they go public. And it's just something to keep an eye on if you're interested in this sort of thing, if you follow technology companies and the tech industry. Typically, when a company floats on the stock market or goes public, there's a lot of due diligence that they need to do. And this can expose the company financials, and it might have exposed some of these records that would show that Nikola's uh, order book was being propped up here by this company that didn't have any money to pay for the orders. Instead of this, what Nikola and many other companies have been doing lately is going public by something called a SPAC, or Special Purpose Acquisition Company. This is a slightly weird way of getting exposed to the stock market. So let's say that you have a private company, Company A. What you do is found another company, Company B. Company B says this is a shell company, it just exists to buy some other company, and we're going to sell shares in this shell company and not tell you what we're buying. 
Company B raises a lot of money by selling its shares to, for example, hedge funds, venture capitalists and other investors. And then Company B uses that money that it's raised to buy Company A. So you sort of get Company A onto the stock market indirectly through this vehicle that is Company B. This is happening a lot. If you look up sort of year of the SPACs and so on, you'll see that this is a big trend in the technology industry this year. Why do people do this? Well, it has a couple of advantages. Critics say that it allows the original company to avoid a lot of the scrutiny and a lot of the investigations and the information that would be required ordinarily to go onto the public markets. This, for example, is from a Forbes article earlier this year called The Rise of SPACs. It says, quote, Some worry that the abbreviated process in which a company goes public through a SPAC leads to less scrutiny than the traditional IPO, and this ultimately provides less time for investors to seek out information about the risks as there isn't the same level of scrutiny applied. Disclosures do not come at the same time and format, and as such, investors may feel the pressure to make a decision without having a full picture of the situation. End quote. Now, it's important to say that just because a company has gone public via a SPAC, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are trying to avoid scrutiny. For many companies and investors, it is just that it's faster and more convenient than having to go through the traditional initial public offering process, where a company is floated on the stock market. Investors may also prefer it. For example, in a normal IPO, the bankers price an initial block of shares for sale before the company's shares are trading on the public market. But in some cases, the initial share price is undervalued, and it turns out that there's a lot of enthusiasm for the company's debut, which causes the share price to shoot up when it first debuts on the market. In some cases, that first day when shares are actually trading on the market, the share price can shoot up by 50 to 100%. But this is bad for the original investors in the company before it went public because they've sort of sold part of their stake, and they're obviously missing out, because that initial public offering was undervalued. When they're selling the company directly to another company, though, they have more control over the price, and they don't need to see it fluctuate like this when it debuts on the public markets. So um, this is from the Financial Times, uh, an article entitled, Can SPACs Shake Off Their Bad Reputation? And they say, quote, Critics of the IPO say that it's racked by opacity, inefficiency, and most of all expense. Investment banks collect 7% of the proceeds as an underwriting fee. The IPO price is also supposed to be priced at a 10-15% to discount to fair value to give some immediate upside to buyers. But often companies see their shares pop on the first day, rising 30 or 40%. Those gains then represented cash the company itself could have raised, or additional shares that it didn't need to sell. Quote, Clearly the rampant and worsening underpricing of IPOs has created a huge opportunity for SPACs. Bill Gurley, the famed venture capitalist and harsh critic of traditional IPOs, wrote in an email to the FT. In fact, many SPACs are started up by those who essentially have cash to burn and who want to quickly build new companies to the public market. So again from this article, quote, From hedge fund billionaire Bill Ackman to sports executive Billy Bean of Moneyball fame, some of the most high-profile investors have sought to raise cash in these blank check SPACs, believing that they can find underappreciated businesses which they can bring to the public markets. By using SPACs, they can skip over the expensive and time-consuming IPO process. These investors are convinced that SPACs have now shed the reputation for being a vehicle that shady financiers use to unload dodgy businesses onto the unsuspecting masses. The boom in SPACs is taking place at a time when trillions of dollars are sitting in private equity and venture capital funds. Therefore, many promising companies feel less pressure to go through the costly and time-consuming process of listing on the stock market to raise that money. For retail investors, SPACs present a chance to buy into fast-growing companies that might otherwise remain private. Yet a Financial Times analysis of the US blank check companies that was organised between 2015 and 2019 shows that these cash shell structures remain a dicey bet for ordinary investors. The poor investment record of many SPACs is a reminder that when Wall Street pushes a new product, clever financiers invariably find a way to shift most of the risk onto ordinary investors, even if a new generation of SPAC founders believes that they will avoid the problems of the past. Overall, investing in a SPAC is like flipping a coin where only half of them are shown to be value-creating, says Milos Vodanovic, a finance professor at a business school who has studied the structure for many years. End quote. So, every single SPAC that exists is obviously not Nikola. Nikola is a pretty bad example of what this kind of thing can be. But I think it does serve as an interesting example, doesn't it? Critics have said these SPACs might be being raised to avoid scrutiny that you get from an initial public offering. Nikola has obviously avoided an awful lot of scrutiny on the way to briefly being worth $20 billion. 
after all, if there was even a little bit of scrutiny, some of these massive issues that have now tanked the company and forced the CEO to resign would have come out, right? And I think this is really just evidence that the tech sector, as we're describing in the SoftBank series right now, is still very frothy. And this froth should concern you because bubbles inevitably burst. And as the Financial Times pointed out, when these bubbles burst, the people who tend to have to pick up the bill, ordinary people tend to have to pick up the bill. It tends to have to be uh, made up for by governments, as we saw in 2008-2009 financial crisis that has caused so much harm to the uh, reputation of the institutions in the world around us and led so directly, I think, to so much of the politics that we see today. Now, we're overrunning here, so I'm going to split this script into more episodes and we'll continue next time. And next episode, I want to talk more specifically about the people who have been profiteering directly from the pandemic, Um, companies involved in making vaccines and therapeutics and some of the uh, the, the dodgy financial wheeling and dealing that's been going on there, to be honest, um, allegedly. And I also think I'll, I'll do a more general update on where I think we are with the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you have any interest in the pandemic and its profiteers, please tune in to that next episode in this little series. In the meantime, then, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thermonuclear Takes from Physical Attraction. If you're interested in the stuff we're talking about, if you'd like to learn more, If you know more about it than I do, which is very possible, please get in touch. You can get in touch with us. The contact form is at physicspodcast.com. I will respond to as many of those emails as I can get. As you'll note, uh, thanks to Jason, who uh, pointed those things out about Tesla, you know, I try and respond to things where people have uh, valid criticisms or comments on the show. If there's something you would like us to cover, please also do that. You can get in touch with us there. You can get in touch with us as well on Twitter at physicspod. The Facebook page is Physical Attraction. There's plenty of different ways that you can engage with the show and our sort of growing community of people who enjoy listening to it. Of course, if you really enjoy listening to it, you can also support us financially. You can do so on the Patreon, where you'll get bonus episodes. The end of the SoftBank series is available there for those who want to listen to it, along with some of these episodes on climate change we've been working on, which can all be obtained earlier than their normal release. And there are some special bonus episodes, including the book club episodes, which will only be available there. So please do tune in to the Patreon and uh, for a very, very small fee, you can get access to all of those bonus episodes. You can also donate directly to the show via PayPal if you just want to help us out. That's our kind of digital tip jar. And both of those things are available on physicspodcast.com. But of course, the best thing you can do to help us out is always to review the show, tell people who might be interested to listen to it. If anyone wants to find out more about Nicola-style shenanigans, this might be the episode to send them. Until next time then, please take care.